This is the web transcription service of the Royal Canadian Military Institute, welcoming you to our Fall 2012 Speakers Program. This evening's event, the first in the season, is Military History Night, held on September the 19th. The evening features Patrick Murphy with a fascinating account of the frantic, deadly serious, and occasionally hilarious preparations made by the people of Britain to resist the expected Nazi invasion in the summer and fall of 1940. My Dad's Army, Khaki Kamikaze. Thank you, Pat, for your kind words of introduction. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Tonight's history presentation, My Dad's Army, Khaki Kamikaze. The world, we are told, began with a big bang and the Great War with a pistol shot. Whereas it's true to say there were none present at the dawn of creation, there were many at Sarajevo to witness the assassination of Archduke Ferdinand on June the 28th, 1914. The curtain raiser for World War II occurred on the 1st of September, 1939, when Scherzweig Holstein, a German training ship on a goodwill visit to Danzig, revealed itself to be a Trojan battleship. Conveniently placed, the warship trained its guns on the Polish port of Westerplatte and opened fire. Acting in concert with the bombardment of Westerplatte, men of the Brandenburg Regiment, disguised as civilians, changed into their uniforms armed themselves, collected explosives smuggled in from Germany and blew up key facilities where once they had worked. Elsewhere on that day, the Brandenburgers slipped over the border from Germany, got behind the Polish defences, seized the bridges over the Vistula River and cleared the way for the German invasion of Poland. What did you do in the war, Dad? I don't ever remember asking my father what he did during the Second World War, and he, like so many others, seldom gave voice to any of his wartime experiences. And it is true to say, I have yet to locate a stash of medals or come across a mention in dispatches linking him to actions above and beyond the call of duty. However, I do recall my dad was in a reserve occupation during the war and have a document identifying the bearer, Mr. J. Murphy, being engaged on important air ministry work. For certain, my father was issued with three passes between May 1941 and April 1942. During that period, he worked on Hunston, Yatesbury and Bryce Norton airfields. Napoleon allegedly said, an army marches on its stomach, and if true for infantry, it should hold good for voyaging seafarers and aviators flying on long-haul sorties. Aircrew or ground staff, few or many, all needed feeding. To sustain the defenders of the nation, it was essential to have an up-and-running catering service 24-7. Come hell, or high water, kitchens had to function all day, every day, or survival rations would become standard issue. My dad was a range fitter. He kept the home fires burning. Industrial kilns in need of quick maintenance or repair, he had in working order well before the brick linings called. Not the nicest of jobs, but vitally in wartime when downtime meant lost output and shortages of much needed materiel. My father, and thousands like him, was engaged in work often described as important and classified as secret. That is not to say what they did was dangerous, exciting, or even life-threatening. Although in some cases it could be said what was seen as mundane concealed the true nature of such work from the prying eyes of enemy agents and those of a faint heart. Deception measures were necessary to hide the purpose of secret enterprise 
and for good reason publicity was to be avoided lest it fuel speculation or triggered panic. A case in point was the clandestine manufacture of tens of thousands of cheap coffins made in advance of pending bomber raids. A prudent measure best kept from the public domain when the estimated death toll would have shocked and alarmed those citizens living in areas most at risk from the bombing. Another hush-hush example was the production of gas and chemical weapons intended for use as a measure of last resort. They were in fact the last throw of the defender's dice. The ubiquitous gas masks were to some extent reassuring. But the use of gas and chemical weapons by either side would have unleashed new miseries on all and sundry. Public interest was best served by shielding the populace from such a prospect. Operating a need to know policy, authorities did what they could to sustain the war effort. Civilian or military, all were expected to undergo their baptism of fire when attacked. As England waited, the invasion bells remained silent. My dad travelled a lot, and only on occasions were we all together as a family in either wartime London or neutral Ireland. At some point during one of those periods of togetherness in the London suburb of Fulham, my father brought home a uniform and a rifle. Having joined the Home Guard, he was required to do training, and it was for such he went to a barracks at St John's Wood, North London. I vaguely recall going to watch him drill and feeling jaded. After hours sitting on the side of the parade ground, my eyes felt heavy. I was done for and went to sleep until, duty done, my father collected me and we headed for home. Some considerable number of years following the end of World War II, a much loved and humorous depiction of the Home Guard's deeds of daring do was screened on TV. The band of brothers that stood in readiness to do battle with Mr. Hitler were characters quite unlike their German opponents. To be precise, they could be more accurately described as a bunch of misfits. Captain Mainwaring, the pompous officer, assisted by well-educated suave and long-suffering Sergeant Wilson, the panic-prone Corporal Jones and his platoon of earnest incompetence assembled together to scupper the enemy and defend the nation in its hour of need and desperation. When scraping the barrel, hope springs eternal. For those who identify with the bumbling manoeuvres of this shambolic squad of would-be soldiers, it is the most enduring image of the Home Guard. A one-time member of the Home Guard replied to questions about Dad's army and his depiction of the volunteer force in action confessed. We were never that good. As in deterrent to invaders, it would be hard to convince anyone that such amiable characters could defy or deter the battle-hardened Wehrmacht and its armoured divisions. Therefore, for some, it may come as a surprise that the image is only part of the story, a story of unbelievable courage and determination that well deserves a hearing. Contrary to common belief that all members of Dad's army were ancient athletic buffoons or wannabe soldiers, the new Home Guard auxiliary units were something else. Amongst the butchers, bakers and candlestick makers, there were resolute men with high-risk missions to perform. Stay-at-home warriors wanting off the leash that held them back because their skill or calling required they stay put. War for them was no joking matter, but a serious business. They were to remain behind, taking no action until the invaders had passed through their towns and villages in hot pursuit of the retreating British army. Only then would the auxiliaries emerge from concealment to attack as planned. Trained to, to disrupt set-piece attacks and cause havoc behind enemy lines, auxiliary patrols were to hinder the progress 
of mechanised units hamper effective use and deployment of enemy formations and sap the morale of troops having to watch their backs at all times, day and night. No small task. Auxiliary units knew they were expendable. And when the Germans overran their hideouts, their life expectancy was measured in days and not likely to exceed two weeks. Even so, knowing the odds, when asked, they still volunteered. There would be no escape for them. And when called on to make the ultimate sacrifice, they were to sell their lives dearly, taking with them as many of the enemy as possible. Their situation did not allow for capture or prisoner taking. The only prospect left, fatalistic combat and forlorn hope. With a war to win, the Germans would then have to deal with organised and sometimes coordinated attacks to their front and rear positions. With contested landings and sustained resistance from the British Army, the last thing needed was severance or disruption of vital supply lines. The Germans were committed and determined, but could they sustain their losses? Crossing the Channel was not as they had hoped for, and certainly not what Goring had promised. What next? A German Dunkirk and Russia. Ever a possibility, the non-aggression pact agreed between the Soviet Union and Germany would prove to be worth less than the paper it was written on. Like Chamberlain's piece of paper, peace for our time. Its durability would last just long enough to suit the needs of the belligerents. All's fair in love and in war, and strange to think, had Soviet Russia decided to take advantage of a situation presented by Germany's preoccupation with its campaign to conquer Great Britain, the Second Front may have started in the East. Had that happened, the Wehrmacht resources could have been stretched, perhaps to an unsustainable level. A Soviet invasion of the Fatherland would have put pressure on Germany to extricate its continental army from its assault on Britain and turn its attention to the threat from the East. Of course, that's all speculation. The Non-Aggression Treaty was torn to shreds when Germany invaded the USSR. In the School of Hard Knocks, it is said you learn from your mistakes. Hindsight helps evaluate actions taken, but when decisions are in the making, consequences are unknown. Hitler's rise to and abuse of power enabled him to extract from Britain and France one concession after another, starting with the rearmament and the reoccupation of the demilitarised Rhineland in 1936, Hitler advanced to go. In 1938 came Schanschluss, the Union of Germany and Austria. In the same year, Czechoslovakia's sedate and borderlands with their formidable mountain fortifications was annexed. Next, Germany absorbed Skoda Steel and Armand's Works. In 1939, the Czechoslovak Republic ceased to exist. Hitler was quite emphatic. He had no further territorial claims to make. But then he seized Bohemia, Moravia, part of Lithuania before crossing the border into Poland. Poland, sandwiched between two avaricious enemies, was swallowed up in 27 days. More was to follow. April 1940, the fate of Denmark and Norway was decided. A short time after them, Luxembourg, Holland, Belgium and France fell like skittles in a bowling alley. Only Britain and its far-flung empire remained standing and committed to the fray. The neutrals kept their distance and tried not to get sucked into the conflict. But as with the Scandinavian and Benelux countries, their neutrality wasn't a safeguard against invasion. Some survived, others succumbed. Surprise and tactical innovations were factors contributing to the phenomenal success of the Wehrmacht strategies. Timing, deceit and guile also, play, also played their part in the events and preparations leading to the commencement of World War II. Talking peace, Germany prepared for war and victory. Across the Channel, remnants of a vanquished army licked its wounds and counted the cost of its defeat. Their Navy and Air Force had their share of casualties to deal with, 
and were engaged in a battle of attrition as yet undecided. October 3rd, 1940, as the besieged Albion watched and waited for the arrival of the invasion fleet, Kurt Karl Goose, a member of the Brandenburg Regiment, the elite adverse-sponsored commando unit, made his descent by parachute. Following regimental practice, and not wishing to be shot as a spy, Goose jumped into the United Kingdom wearing his uniform and carrying his paybook. Landing close to Wellingborough, he changed into civilian clothes, disposed of his parachute, and hid his equipment in a barn. His mission was to cover northwest England from Bedford to Liverpool, the Reds. <clears throat> he was to include Leicester, Coventry and Birmingham in his radio transmissions of meteorological data and reports on civilian morale and the whereabouts of roadblocks, told to remain in Britain until after the invasion and to rejoin the German army as and when possible. With the enemy organising its assault and the defenders making ready to oppose them, only the outcome of the confrontation was in doubt. Ahead lay a testing time. The planned invasion of England was given the go-ahead by Hitler on July 16, 1940, starting with the attack on the aerial defences of Britain. The Luftwaffe attempted to neutralise the RAF in advance of the invasion barges putting to sea. The Royal Navy had its hands full dealing with convoys, U-boats and mine clearance, but were ready to deal with any invasion fleet that ventured forth from continental ports. On land, Britain had for the defence of the entire country only 27 divisions of weapon-starved troops. With the mother of all battles pending, the mother of invention was pressed into service. And strange as it may seem, the situation for some was a deja vu experience. Among staff members of the Ostley Park Training School, there were former members of the anti-fascist international brigades. Having fought in the Spanish Civil War against Franco and his German supporters, the instructors knew what to expect. Situated just west of London, Osterley Park Mansion was well suited to the need of its instructors and students, making use of the lavish grounds for resistance training. Funded by the Earl of Jersey and the magazine Picture Post, Osterley was a prestigious school for guerrillas. Heavily promoted by the picture posts as a place of learning on gentlemanly warfare, hand-to-hand -hand combat, ambushing of tanks, hit-and-run raids, and much else. Members of the Home Guard from all over the country made their way to Ostley for a two-day crash course. From mid-July to mid-September 1940, the number of trainees attending the school quadrupled to 250 a week. As its reputation grew, elements of the regular army attended, including soldiers from the Brigade of Guards. Officially, the regular army wasn't interested in guerrilla warfare or street fighting, as lessons learned in Spain and now taught at Osterley were less suited to their way of combat. That is not to say the teaching methods employed at the school were ignored or discarded. Ostley Park's training was intended to meet perceived needs of irregular forces obliged to wage a guerrilla war on an occupation army of great strength. The success of the training was to influence the thinking of its supporters and inspire others to follow the trail blazed by the veterans of the Spanish Civil War. They and their colorful band of helpers pointed the way. A participant in the Osterley Park training wrote, it is a pioneering place, which I hope will be developed all over the country for all those who are determined that never will this soil be yielded up without the bitterest of struggle. The struggle to come promised to be bitter indeed, and Britain will be challenged as never before. However, the country was not without leadership. And when the policies of appeasement failed, the situation called for a different approach and resolute action. Churchill took the helm of a coalition government tasked with the defence 
of the nation and the freedom of its citizens come what may. Churchill's mastery of the English language inspired the hope that the forces raged against Britain and her allies could and would be defeated. There would be no soft options for those who defy the German juggernaut. Defiance came with a price tag and no guarantee. With the Swiss Creek and the phony war over, the rescue troops from the continent reached Britain with uniforms and precious little else. The circumstances of their hurried departure made it difficult for them to retain their weapons. Some managed to hang on to firearms, others did not. What mattered most was they escaped captivity and after rest and recuperation, they would rejoin the battle for survival. However, short of arms and ammunition, the defenders were up against it. Once landed, the Wehrmacht would be in a position to outgun the lightly armed allies. With time pressing, something had to be done to even the odds PDQ. To the Germans, the Blitzkrieg was a winning formula and one for which the Allies had yet to find an answer for. The Wehrmacht's ability to use dive bombers as airborne artillery enabled its armour and mobile infantry to exploit breaches in enemy defences and systematically isolate and eliminate its opponents piecemeal. At all times, they use their mobility to overcome the obstacles barring their way. The English Channel was different. Not just a big river to cross, but a water divide that didn't allow for the use of armour in the manner accustomed. With England alerted to its real and present danger, surprise was out of the question. Germany's planned invasion of the United Kingdom needed armoured support if it was to succeed against an opposed landing. A resolute army defending its homeland could be counted on to provide a vigorous opposition to enemy attack, especially if retreat was no longer a viable option. Then their determination to fight on regardless might well make conquest a costly affair. When Britain rejected Hitler's peace overtures, the occupation of England became a must. Germany's Western Front had to be secured against continued attack from Britain and its allies. The Wehrmacht started working on submersible tanks. Meanwhile, on the other side of the big river, two British officers pushed their way through a flock of sheep. Reaching hill, they climbed to the top where they sat on the edge of a sheep trough to rest and take in the scenery. For a while, they sat looking over the Kentish countryside, towards the English Channel. The view was magnificent. The senior of the two officers was not best pleased. He had just stumbled on a well-kept secret. General Montgomery did not like being kept in the dark and especially being kept ignorant about the existence of a secret army operating in an area under his command. Turning to speak to his companion, he was taken aback. Nowhere was he to be seen. Given that they were on the top of a hill and some distance from cover, where had the young officer disappeared to? Montgomery heard the missing officer call to him from somewhere near the ground. As he turned, he caught sight of Captain Norman Field appearing through a rectangular opening in the bottom of the feeding trough. When in command of troops around Brighton, Montgomery was aware of the existence of auxiliary units in Sussex. However, when he assumed command of 12 Corps, he was not advised that Kent, like its neighbour, Sussex, had an up and running resistance organisation in place. The failure to inform the general was an omission, which gave Montgomery cause for concern. Had the auxiliary units laid mines and booby traps, and if so, could they be set off by civilians or children? When assured such was not the case, the general insisted on visiting the operational bases to see for himself what the resistance was doing. The tour of inspection began with the sheep trough. The guide showed the general the nail head that sprung the trapdoor, concealing access to a chamber big enough to accommodate two men. This chamber was an underground observation post. Rabbit holes served as an observation apertures, 
Outside, the burrows were unaltered, but inside they were carefully glazed, weatherproofed and ready for use by auxiliaries surveying the valley below. The general inspection of the Kent hideouts went well, and like the first, the other hideouts were ex- impressive, and their amazing design a lasting testament to the ingenuity of Peter Fleming, brother of Ian Fleming, the author and creator of Shaken Not Stirred, James Bond. The sophistication of the auxiliary unit hideouts, officially known as operational bases, was a far, far cry from earlier bolt holes constructed by unit patrols operating on their own initiative. No longer turf-covered holes in the ground, but purpose-built hideouts with enough room to accommodate patrols, weapons and ammunition. Although facilities were fairly basic, patrol bases had everything needed for short-term occupation. Not a home from home, but a place of concealment, affording a modicum of comfort for transient dwellers. Bases were constructed on the conditions of utmost secrecy, and when required, elaborate subterfuge was employed to conceal their whereabouts and associated building works. To illustrate the pains taken to install a hideout, let us return to Peter Fleming's sheep trough. Situated as it was on the top of the hill, without even a fig leaf to hide behind, it was difficult to excavate and move soil without the world and its dog knowing. After a lot of thought, Peter Fleming found a solution. Borrowing an anti-aircraft gun, he set it up on the hilltop and surrounded it with sandbags. Once the sandbags were in place, excavation work began. Weeks later, the AA gun was relocated. With it went sandbags and the soil from the excavation. Only the sheep troughs remained behind. Elsewhere, solutions were found for project problems. Excavated chalk was hard to hide, and as it turned out, hiding the chalk was not the answer to the problem. Instead, chalk spoil was dumped into pits to await the next aerial attack. Time to coincide with attack. Explosive charges in the pits were detonated to scatter the spoil and make it appear that an enemy plane had dropped its bombs before hightailing it back to base. Nothing new for an area on the constant bomber attack. Work on bases was done in the hours of darkness when the likelihood of being seen was reduced to the minimum. Auxiliaries were in the main response for the location and construction of their hideouts. Engineers and civilian contractors brought in to work on sections of the hideout construction were kept unaware of the purpose and intended use of the bases. When finished, they were whisked away with due dispatch. Auxiliary units then took over the work of camouflaging and equipping bases for operational use. Camouflage was of a high standard and had to be to hide evidence of excavation from terrestrial or aerial inspection. Habitat was restored to what it was before work started. For this reason, bases were located close to well-used paths because human and animal traffic cover the tracks of auxiliaries making use of them. With access to bases situated just off the beaten track, Trample vegetation was less likely to excite interest or betray the existence of a nearby hideout. Of course, the best laid plans of mice and men off go astray, and occasionally clever schemes are undone by chance. A courting couple, blissfully unaware that their resting place was on top of a trapdoor, was alarmed when the ground moved onto them. What for them was a tectonic shift were proved to be no more than an auxiliary making an exit. In great haste, the couple made for the police station. The duty officer dealing with the report referred it to the army. Following their investigation, the base was abandoned. Many, if not all, bases were equipped with paraffin lighting, running water, primer stoves, sleeping bunks, and last but not least, a chemical toilet. To avoid detection, hollow trees and burrows were used as ventilation ducts. Access to and exit from operational bases was via a hatch. Hasty exit was by way 
of the escape tunnel provided. Operational base are capable of accommodating seven-man patrols and their equipment. Extra arms, ammunition and supplies were stored at different locations just in case ready access to operational bases became either impossible or hazardous. Intelligence officers had their own bases designated as IO bases. They were larger in size and big enough to house extra supplies and fugitive auxiliary units. When overrun, operational IO bases located in enemy occupied territory were well placed to exercise effective control of auxiliary units. Intelligence officers behind the lines and with their units were less likely to be captured trying to reach their bases. With backs against the wall, the officers were there to call the shots and share the fate of their men. Leaders and led, alive or dead, their swan song to be diehard auxiliaries. The auxiliaries were formed in the spring of 1940 and from the start all were required to sign the Official Secrets Act. Apart from regular army officers, all auxiliaries were volunteers. Prior to joining, they were vetted by the police. <clears throat> Once cleared by the police, candidates were approached and asked to join the auxiliaries. Those who agreed to join were issued with home guard uniforms bearing their battalion's insignia. Each battalion was numbered and assigned a district, 201 Scotland, 202 Northern England and 203 Southern England. These battalions were not recognised or covered by the provisions of the Geneva Convention. Essentially, auxiliaries were private citizens in uniform and could be shot if captured. Hitler had decreed members of the Home Guard would suffer the same fate after invasion. What sort of men were recruited for the auxiliary units? The recruiting of unit patrols began with the unit leader. World War I veterans were the preferred candidates as having seen service, they were less in need of training. Usually they were from the locality and familiar with the area in which they would operate. Leaders would then choose six men from the area, such as farmers, agricultural workers, gamekeepers, poachers and the like. People familiar with the terrain and able to find their way when out and about in the dark of night. Unit members from the Home Guard were selected on the recommendation of their senior commanders. Local Home Guard officers were often furious when their best men were transferred from their detachments to duties unspecified without reason or explanation given. Senior officers knew about the secret auxiliary units. They were not privy to the details of their use or employment. Because of the uniforms they wore, Auxiliaries were assumed to belong to the Home Guard. Explanation for their conduct or nocturnal absences was considered unnecessary and inappropriate. Of course, wives harbouring suspicions may have questioned the need and the frequency of night manoeuvres, and doubts as to their husband's fidelity did service, but for the duration all such concerns were filed away for another day. Either way, sworn to secrecy, auxiliaries were unable to protest their innocence or plead guilty as charged. Silence is golden. For the Home Guard volunteers, it was business as usual and hiding behind the Home Guard skirts, the auxiliaries honed their skills and waited in the shadows. Time marches on. Defence preparations require intense training and with the invasion clock ticking, there was no time to waste. Instructors and training facilities had to be found. August 1940, Colon House in Berkshire became the headquarters for auxiliary unit training. Surrounded by extensive parklands and close to Swindon and its communication, this secluded estate was secure from the prying eyes of unwelcome observers. The main dwelling and stables were adapted and used for accommodation and administration. Training sessions were over weekends because auxiliaries were seen as home guard volunteers and had to operate in a manner consistent with their aliases. 
Military training and occupational work served as a cloak for their clandestine activities and trips to Coal Hill House. Auxiliary members participating in the programme of training were to make themselves known to the local postmistress in Highworth, a town close to Swindon. The postmistress would satisfy herself that the trainee's identification was in order and then telephone Coal Hill to send transport to collect a parcel addressed to them. A further security check followed when transport arrived. All being as it should, the parcel was delivered to Coal Hill. Once at the training school, the unit members would be put through their paces by teams of specialists, including Army Commando Detachments. The training programme was intense and demanding. Instruction on the use of weapons, explosives, unarmed combat and guerrilla tactics was followed by nighttime exercises designed to test their newly acquired skills. Come Monday, they were back at work as usual. Give us the tools. The British resistance movement had first call on all available weapons and equipment. Clearly, the auxiliaries were considered to be worth the trouble and expense to warrant such largesse at a time of much need and shortage. Toothless tigers were no defence against attack and the defenders of the United Kingdom needed weapons if they were to do the job entrusted to them. The Prime Minister insisted all auxiliary members had personal sidearms, revolvers or automatic, automatic handguns as well as weapons for their personal protection Units were supplied with rifles, grenades, knives, clubs and Tommy guns, Thompson submachine guns. The list of sabotage equipment included time pencil fuses, pressure and pull switches, explosives and other devices and materials thought necessary for guerrilla war. Auxiliaries were well trained, armed and determined. Dad's Army. Here's a sobriquet for the Home Guard. The Home Guard was called the Local Defence volunteers before they had a name change. The local defence volunteers were dubbed Look, Duck and Vanish. Their detractors also referred to them as parachutes. The Home Guard's reputation has survived to this day as an example of fortitude in desperate times. Elders and valiant youth together, gallant souls in uniform. When the call came, they filled the breach as needed. When the Secretary for War, Anthony Eden, broadcast to the nation on the 14th of May 1940, he stated, We want large numbers of men who are British subjects between the ages of 17 and 65 to come forward now and offer their service in order to make assurance double sure. The name of the new Defence Force that is to be raised will be the Local Defence Volunteers. Within days, a quarter of a million men volunteered, and by the end of the Battle of Britain, the number had climbed to a million. Young and old, they didn't hang back, and though humour has exacted a high price for television fame, they have, not, they have stood the test of time and gladden our hearts to this day. Their escapades were not restricted to those as seen on TV. One anecdote I would like to share with you tonight is about the Home Guard Detachment enjoying their pints in a hostelry in my hometown, the village of Yule in England. As they downed their ale, the door burst open and someone shouted, They're here! Everyone present understood that they, meant German parachutists, had arrived. For a moment there was a hush, then a voice was heard say, well, we might as well finish our beer first. In the circumstances, such a comment might be considered strange. But to those who weaned on the story of Drake's reaction to the sighting of the Spanish Armada, it is no surprise. When danger threatens, play it cool and finish your game. Drake finished his bowling and dealt with the Armada. Others of a more on charitable disposition might say it was the Englishman's penchant for warm beer that delayed their response to the threat of invasion. Mind not to reason why, one but once hooked on warm beer, anything below tepid 
is to be frowned upon. Their glasses emptied, our intrepid band went forth. As it happened, the German paratroopers turned out to be Canadians who had yet to master the delights of warm beer. They were so deliriously happy following their tipple, they climbed aboard their motorcycle combination and took off. Racing up and down your bypass, they took to firing their brain gun at random. Hearing the shooting, all citizens were expected to act in accordance with instructions given and leave the military to deal with firefights and the like. When order was restored and doubts as to the identity of the alleged parachutists resolved, it became clear that the sidecar of the Canadian motorcycle combination was, like the Germans, mounted on the opposite side to that of the British. Flying bullets lent credence to the misconception and belief the eagle had landed. The incident passed without any mishap and serves only to illustrate the wisdom of avoiding warm beer. It is an acquired taste, best left to experts and those chilly mortals who like their beer served at 10 above zero. When formed, the LDV, before it became the Home Guard, was created from scratch and had to be kitted out, armed and trained from nothing to a fighting force in a short time. Needless to say, the, seed, the need for arms and equipment outstripped supply as volunteer numbers mushroomed. Early issue uniforms produced many bizarre results and gave rise to the stereotype characters identified with Dad's Army. The volunteers may have been a source of amusement and ridicule, but the fact they existed was not without benefit. As well as providing opportunities for military training, they were engaged in numerous defence activities. Easing the burden of the armed services was just part of a contribution which included work in the offices, factories and the fields of a nation at war. My name is not Colin Firth and what follows is not a remake of the King's Speech but a presse of his BBC address to the nation on the evening of December 3, 1944. Over four years ago, in May 1940, our country was in mortal danger. The most powerful army the world has ever seen had forced its way to within a few miles of our coast. From day to day, we were threatened with invasion. For most of you, and I must add for your wives too, your service in the Home Guard has not been easy. Some of you have stood for many hours on the gun sites in desolate fields or windswept beaches. Many of you, after a long and hard day's work, scarcely had time for food before you changed into uniform for the evening parade. The King goes on to define the trials and tribulations of the Home Guard before finishing his appraisal with, but you have gained something for yourselves. You have discovered in yourselves new capabilities. You have found how men from all kinds of homes and many different occupations can work together in great cause and how happy they can be with each other. I am very proud of what the Home Guard has done and I give my heartfelt thanks to you all. I know that your country will not forget that service. 1944, December 31, the Home Guard was stood down. December 1945, the Home Guard was disbanded. The auxiliaries were the hidden face of the Home Guard. Their contribution went further and was without question fatalistic in outlook and character. Their acceptance of the predictable was the limit of their expectations and destiny. Once their position was overrun, each day was a bonus. So for them, the song, praise the Lord and pass the ammunition, said it all. Even though the steel of the auxiliaries was never tested, their bravery was beyond question. They were ready for the enemy, but the invaders never came. Had they done so, the British resistance movement would have broken cover and their existence would have been a secret no longer. Their courage and sacrifice 
might have saved the day when hope was in short supply and all was thought to be lost. As the invasion failed to materialise, Kurt Karl Goose never did get to rejoin the German army. Instead, he joined other ever agents in captivity, and like them, when made an offer he found hard to refuse, he opted to switch sides and work for British intelligence. As a double agent, he took part in, dece- in a deception program designed to field credible information, misinformation to the German intelligence and Wehrmacht commanders, responsible for the planning and implementation of Operation Sea Lion. The invasion of England was deferred and later abandoned. However, whilst the conflict continued, measures taken to defend the nation against invasion remained in force. May 1944, auxiliaries from Northumberland received secret movement orders. Wearing Home Guard uniforms, they boarded a train and sat in a reserve compartment. On its way south, the train stopped several times. Each time it stopped, more Home Guard members joined the train. At Portsmouth, the resistant members embarked on a ferry that took them through ships of the invasion fleet to the Isle of Wight. Once ashore, the reason for their presence was explained. With the Allied invasion of Europe pending, the fear was the Germans might mount a landing on the island. Had they done so, Portsmouth, a main resupply base for the Allied invasion forces, would have been under serious threat. Should that happen, the auxiliaries were to attack and destroy the enemy forces from behind their own lines. Without drawing attention to themselves, the resistance men set about organising their defence of the island, dug in and waited for the enemy. The Normandy landings passed without, off without the anticipated counter-attack. Two weeks after D-Day, the auxiliaries were spirited off the island and returned to their homes. And so it came to part. Uh, sorry, in November 1944, the War Office decided the war situation had improved enough to enable the operational side of the auxiliaries to stand down. And so it came to pass. Patrol members continued their daily work routines without night duties or training, making further demands on them. Still constrained by the Official Secrets Act, auxiliaries kept silent about their membership of the British. Resistance. Members of the military seconded to the auxiliaries returned to their units to await demobilisation at war's end. The Defence Medal awarded to Home Services branches was not awarded to auxiliary unit members. In their stand down letter, the explanation given was in view of the fact your lives depended on secrecy, no public recognition will be possible. Recognition for the years of service, hardship and sacrifice was confined to a small souvenir enamelled lapel badge with a crown and battalion numbers device. Old soldiers never die, they simply fade away. And the auxiliaries did just that. Without medal or mention, the shadow army just vanished into civil into thin air. Thank you, ladies. On behalf of the RCMI, this is Eric Morse saying thank you for listening to us today. Watch for announcements of future event transcripts, and we hope that you will be able to join us in person for our regular speakers' events. Once again, thank you for tuning into our podcasts, and have a wonderful day.